Hey Mari, don't eat something if you don't know what it is. Wouldn't it be cool if you could walk outside your home and harvest heaps and heaps of delicious, nutritious plants that were better than store-bought organic food? I think so. And I have good news for everybody watching because this is not only easy to do, but it's much more convenient than driving anywhere to the store and buying said nutritious, delicious food. And in this video, I'm gonna show you exactly how I would do it and hopefully teach you how you can do it too. So if you give me some of your precious time, in this video, I'm gonna show you how to identify 10 plus edible weeds. And not only that, but I'm gonna show you how to identify them in a safe and responsible manner so that you'll remember them for the rest of your life and you'll know how to differentiate clover from dandelion and beyond as easy as you already can differentiate between like an orange, an apple, and a banana. So if that sounds like a really good trade to you, then stick around because this should be fun and educational. One more thing to add. If you're watching from the couch right now, I highly recommend that you pause the video, pull me up on your phone or other mobile device, step outside with me in whatever capacity is convenient for you. Try and find some plants and follow along because I kind of think that you're gonna get more out of it if you do it in this manner. This will turn this foraging hike into a hands-on experience for you and thus the learning will be deeper and more well-rounded. And without further ado, let's just hop right in. Ready, set, go. This sea of green is our overgrown garden patch from last year. Last year we had lots of weeds in the garden. I made a video about that already. And this year in April, I think right now it's like April 5th or something, the garden looks even more unruly because we haven't weeded it yet. And I've saved this unruliness just for my YouTube audience because I think it's a good opportunity for learning. So next, like tomorrow, Thursday, my wife and I are gonna go through and we're gonna pull all these weeds and get the rows ready for planting our garden veggies. And in the interim, we're gonna do like a forage through it. I wanna point out that I haven't really explored this very much on my own. I kind of cruised through there lightly yesterday. I identified some things. And so this is gonna hopefully keep things organic and spontaneous for everybody watching, myself included. And so now you know the backstory. The very first thing that I wanna point out about this patch of greens is that it's a little bit overwhelming. I mean, you look at that and you're like, I just see grass and not much more. And so I want you to note that because by the end of this video, you might be surprised how much of that feeling gets transformed. Right now, maybe some of you watching can't differentiate between certain plants, but I'm confident that by the end of this video, you will be able to. And so just kind of make a note of that and uh, here we go. The very first thing that I always talk about in my foraging hikes, the very first plant is grass. And I do this systematically because grass is something that most people can easily identify. Most of us have seen grass at one point or another in our lives. And while grass is not the most delicious plant you'll ever taste, it's extremely nutritious. And so for that reason, health food stores and juice bars often sell little shots of wheatgrass for four to six dollars, something like that kind of pricey. There's no reason whatsoever why you couldn't harvest pesticide-free wild growing grass and juice it yourself for free. You know, grass is something that's a little bit hard for the human body to digest if you were to eat it raw, but if you blend it in a blender and make a smoothie out of it, if you juice it in a juicer and extract the juice away from the pulp, you can easily capitalize on all of the nutrition of grass and it's very nutritious. It's full of vitamins, minerals, micronutrients. In a pinch, if there's literally nothing else to eat and you're in dire, you know, in a dire situation, then there are parts of the grass that can be digested by the human body. And let me just quickly show you how to find those parts. So if you pull on some grass stalks carefully, No, that didn't do it. This never does it on camera the first time. I've been experimenting for years and I've never been able to get it on the first try. So I'm just literally grabbing long grass. Ooh, look at that. So that right there is a good lesson in Mary stems. When you pull on a blade of grass and expose this lighter green tip, that is known as a meristematic bit. And that simply means that it's the growing part of a plant. So that is gonna be much more nutritious, much more full of carbohydrates, vitamins, and minerals, and it's gonna taste a lot better. 
And so in a survival situation, you can literally eat this part. So you're gonna just find a nice looking blade of grass and you're just gonna gently but firmly tug on the top. This is much easier to do when you're not holding a camera and trying to be steady. If you pull, eek, sometimes you hear a squeak and that's what you're looking for. That light green inner part. Oops. And so this part right here is the growing part of the grass and it's much more nutritious and much more delicious. And often when I'm hiking, while I don't really generally eat grass like I already mentioned, often when I'm just hiking in the forest, one of my pastimes is to pull on grass, expose this little green part and eat it. If you're out and about hiking around and you pull on some grass, just like I showed you, let that be testament that you already learned something. So just to demonstrate my point, once you pull on the blade of grass and expose this light green tip, that's the part you're gonna eat. Like the first inch and a half, two inches, it's gonna be very tender. It tastes sweet and cool, kind of like a cucumber. And that right there is literally the most nutritious part of grass. And now you know, that's plant number one. Onward with my makeshift stool. Let's talk about dandelions next. <clears throat> this looks like a good specimen right here, right next to Mari's bone with a spider in it. <clears throat> so plant number two is the dandelion. In my travels, I have visited 66 countries and I've been able to find some variety of dandelion in about 60 of them. So it's readily available all across the globe which means if you're watching this from Europe or Asia or beyond, it's highly likely that the knowledge I'm giving you from Oregon is applicable to your area. If I recall correctly, there's something like 300 plus different varieties of dandelion, all of which are edible. The flowers are edible, the leaves are edible, the roots are edible. In one of my videos, I show you how to make dandelion root coffee that's caffeine free and kind of a fun project to do with your friends and family on the weekend. If you've never done this before, here's your homework. Find a clean dandelion flower that hasn't been peed on by animals or sprayed with pesticides and put it in your mouth. This one in particular tastes all right. It's a little bit sweet and kind of delicious. I mean, it's no jelly donut, but it is edible. If you like greens like kale or asparagus, you'll likely like a dandelion flower. But another way that I like to incorporate wild edibles into my diet is simply by cramming them into everything I'm already eating anyway. So for example, if I'm making a sandwich or a wrap or a pizza, I literally pile whatever weeds I have on hand onto said sandwich or wrap or pizza, thus making it a little bit more exciting, more gourmet looking and much more nutritious. And I do this because it's a very simple and easy way to diversify my diet. You can also go after the leaves which are significantly more bitter, but there's a trick to these leaves, to eating these leaves as well. So if you wanna reduce the bitterness of dandelion leaves, you can either blend them in a smoothie with sweet fruit, like a green smoothie, a wild edibles green smoothie, and thus reduce the really bitter taste of the dandelion greens. You could also blend these leaves with some sort of fat. And one recipe I often advocate is dandelion pesto because when you mix bitterness with um, like pine nuts or Parmesan cheese or even olive oil, uh, the bitterness complements that recipe. So not only does the bitterness reduce in intensity, but it also adds to the recipe. So if you're watching out there and you wanna try something new, you can harvest some dandelion leaves and put them in your pesto. Just like with grass and its meristematic bits, if you go for the smaller dandelion leaves, you're gonna find that they're much less bitter than the big leaves. And so that's kind of a fun thing to do. Explore all your possibilities by going for the, the smaller, more delicious greens. And you know, on that note, maybe this is why people prioritize baby greens in their salads because those greens are smaller, 
less bitter, and much more pleasant for the palate. And the same is true for wild edibles and weeds. One of my wild edibles teachers, a gal named Karen Sherwood from Earthwalk Northwest, she has some wisdom that I like to repeat over and over again. And her wisdom is that the difference between knowing a plant very well and not knowing it at all is simply just time. You know, when you were first learning about bananas or apples, for example, you probably couldn't differentiate them well right away like when you were a kid. And then over time, you spent more and more time looking at apples and bananas and got better at differentiating them. Well, the same is true for wild plants. So if you sit down with a dandelion and just describe it to yourself, you'll learn it for the rest of your life and you'll know how to identify it. So let's take a moment here and now and look at this leaf that I'm holding and try and describe it in such a way that you'll remember it. So. For example, I'll kind of help you out since I'm the only one talking. This leaf has very jagged teeth on it. So it's very serrated looking and has jagged teeth. That is one good identifying characteristic of dandelions. Now this is not always the case. Some leaves have more rounded lobes, but often dandelions have really jagged teeth. Another good identifying characteristic is that this main vein on the dandelion is very well pronounced and is very smooth to the touch. Experience has taught me that true dandelions have a smooth stem, whereas dandelion lookalikes often have a fuzzy stem. And that's kind of like a foolproof way to identify dandelions without any sort of mishap every single time. And then of course, we already talked about it, but it's worth mentioning again, that if you see a yellow flower, that is perhaps the best way to identify a dandelion positively. So dandelions would be plant number two. From here, we don't even have to move that far away to find our third plant. And our third plant is gonna be called lance leaf plantain, this plant right here. I say lance leaf because there are numerous types of different plantain out there. And this one just happens to have leaves that are oblong and lance shaped, and that's why it's called lance leaf plantain. This plant right here is also edible and medicinal, and one of the most important plants to learn about because it's a remedy for skin ailments. I talk about this plant often in my videos because it's very important to know about. When used as a poultice, can alleviate bug bites, stings, cuts, nicks, anything that you could do to your skin to harm it, this thing will help. So. If you ever get stung by a bee, for example, you can take this leaf, chew it up, and apply that goop onto the affected area, and you'll notice instant relief, reduction of swelling, your bee bite will just go away. And people often say, that sounds like magic, Sergey." And to that I reply, I agree, it is magic. So how I would identify this to myself is, uh, I notice that on the bottom of the leaf, this is kind of the top, this is the bottom, the veins are very pronounced and parallel and there's numerous of them, right? They're all running together and they're very easy to spot. And so that to me is a very good identifying characteristic. It's kind of early in the season and so I'm not really seeing any seed pods of the plantain. So we can't really use those to identify the plant for us. But we could also pull an entire plant and look at it. Look, at first glance, it kind of looks like grass, especially because there's grass in it. Okay, let's try that again. Practice makes perfect, right? So I'm gonna try and separate a bunch of plantain from grass, dandelion, and anything else that might be there. Boom, just like so. Here are some very thin, slender plantain leaves. It's worth mentioning that this plant is also edible. It's got all kinds of vitamins and minerals in it, and you can't eat it, though it is an advanced green. It tastes very much like really, really dark kale, and so this is not gonna be everybody's favorite food to eat, but there are tips and tricks for consuming this in a very pleasant manner. On that note, I'm considering starting a little mini-series on YouTube where I take one edible at a time show you how to identify it, show you how to harvest it, and then take it into my kitchen and prepare food with it in a manner that I would do for myself or for my family. Leave me a comment below, show me some support, and help light a fire under my butt so that I actually go and do it. While the camera is turned on me right now, I quickly just wanna show you how to make a poultice out of plantain for your skin. 
It's literally as simple as taking a leaf, chewing it in your mouth. Kind of tastes like spinach, actually. And then this little green thing right here, that's what you would actually put on your skin to alleviate any bugs, bites, cuts, nicks, and scratches. That right there. Okay, so just to keep track, plantain was plant number three. And we are gonna go for clover, this guy right here, as plant number four. And then we're gonna go for common mallow right over there as plant number five. These little leaves right here are known as common clover. Typically they have three oval leaves and white, pink, red, purple flowers. Though it's still pretty early in the season again, so there are no flowers to show you here and now. And clover is in the pea family. So a lot of pea plants have the three leaves on them. This plant is also very edible and kind of tastes like a pea sprout. If you ever buy like pea shoots at the grocery store or maybe you grow them yourself, clover is kind of like a natural version of that, like a wild edible version is what I'm trying to say. You'll notice uh, that I'm eating a lot of plants here and just casually throwing them in my mouth. I do this because I've had extensive experience with these plants and I know that they don't affect my body negatively. One word of caution to those that might be doing this for the very first time, I highly recommend that you try foods that are new to you one at a time. So don't mix your weeds in other words, because all our bodies are different and you never can be sure how new food affects you the very first time you try it. When we are children and we're learning about our food allergies, whether or not we have them, when you're exploring wild edibles as an adult, you're essentially going back to your childhood roots of learning whether or not you're allergic to certain foods. So for best practices, when you're out and about, just try one food at a time until you clear it for yourself. That method will help keep you safe and secure, which is the goal of all experienced and um, <laughs> ethical foragers, I think. And so please be careful out there. So this is clover again. And they taste quite nice. Also kind of sweet, kind of cool. It's a cool morning in Southern Oregon. Very pleasant and they're raw form, especially if you like greens. Most clovers have three leaves and the leaves are oval, not heart shaped. Generally, the leaves are gonna be slightly lighter on the bottom of the leaf than the top. And they're also gonna have these little crescent shaped markings on the leaves. These are all really good identifying characteristics. And if you look really closely, to the edges of the leaf. You'll notice that the leaf edges are slightly serrated and those are all really good key identifying characteristics of the clover. Now, it's important to note that nature is not here for our convenience. I am straight up plagiarizing that sentence from another foraging buddy of mine whose name is John Kalis. That's one of his catchphrases. He says, nature is not here for our convenience. He's spot on because these markings aren't always gonna be present. There's just differences in plant life and animal life out there. And so while these markings right here are kind of pronounced, but not really, it's kind of cool and important probably to illustrate that some clover leaves are gonna have much bigger markings. In modern world, we're accustomed to having disclaimers on everything and having clear and concise instructions about everything. And the simple fact is that in the nature world, that just doesn't exist. Everything is slightly different than everything else. Even within one species of plant like clover, you're going to find lots and lots of striations and variations and, you know, differences. And that's kind of important to note because you're going to have to learn how to circumnavigate those things. Any new skill that you learn, whether it's foraging or remodeling your kitchen or building a sauna trailer, there's going to be a learning curve and there's nothing you can really do about that. Just to kind of solidify my point, here's another clover leaf with no markings on it. Now, if I were to only look at clover crescent shaped markings to identify the clover, that would be a problem because by that metric, this would not be a clover. And for that reason, we learn how to identify a plant in numerous categories so that if leaves don't have markings, for example, you could look at the other things like the fact that it has three leaves, the leaves are oval shaped, and there's tiny little micro serrations on the leaf. And all of those things communicate to me that this is indeed a clover. So thus far we've talked about grass, that's one, dandelions, that's two, 
Um, we did plantain, that's three, and clover, that's four. So four plants down, six more to go. And while the camera's facing on me right now, I just wanna quickly congratulate you for taking the time to expand your world with wild edibles knowledge. I personally feel that there's never been a better time to learn how to forage because, well, for many reasons. Two of which are, number one, inflation's on the rise. Depending on which news source you trust, it's sitting somewhere between seven and 10%, maybe even higher. And so all of the money that we earn while working can't be stretched as far as we once could. And so I believe that when you learn how to harvest free food from nature, then you're literally putting money back into your pocket. You're starting a savings account of sorts. So that's reason number one. And then reason number two, that's very important as well, is that this food has not been tampered with. This is literally the best quality food that you can get and it's free. You don't have to go to the health food store. You don't have to spend crazy money buying organic foods. You literally go outside and harvest from your yard or if you don't have a yard, you can go to a public park or to public land and harvest a lot of these plants free of charge and get better quality food at that. Now, some people are gonna say, well, how dare you recommend that people go and pillage public lands, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, you guys are right. And I'm not arguing that we should all be foraging responsibly so as not to impact any sort of ecosystems uh, because believe it or not, I love nature. I don't wanna harm nature. I don't wanna see it go away. That said, a lot of the plants I'm talking about here and now, if not most of the plants, they're all noxious weeds. And so you're actually helping your local ecology by eating those plants. You're benefiting accordingly because they're nutritious. And then the national park, the public land, the park, your backyard, they're benefiting because you're getting rid of some of those noxious weeds. And that is a beautiful symbiotic relationship. Plant number five, is this plant right here and it's known as common mallow right here boom this you guys is has been eaten by a bug look at that this plant is so tasty that bugs love it let's find a good leaf that kind of represents it a little bit better how about that boom this is essentially wild okra believe it or not this is a wild edible relative of the domesticated plant called okra and it is one of my favorite wild edibles in terms of flavor. This is a very delicious plant. It's a little bit on the slimy side, so if you don't like that consistency, you might not be a fan, but that slime has lots of different benefits. It's great for soups because it kind of coagulates them and makes them a little bit more rich, and it does exactly that for smoothies. So if you're somebody that's followed my green smoothie challenge or just from time to time make any kind of smoothies, if you add a little bit of this plant into said smoothies, it's gonna bind the smoothie better and prevent it from separating and looking like swamp thing is about to emerge from your glass jar. So in the tradition that we're quickly creating here and now, let's just learn how to identify this plant for life together. And so again, I'm gonna give you a couple seconds where you can look at this leaf and try and describe what it looks like. I see that this leaf has lobes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven-ish lobes. Uh, now this plant sometimes has more, sometimes less, but it has like little mini lobes. That's an important classification. And it's also got kind of like a hexagon shape. If we dig a little deeper and pull on the plant itself, I don't know if the, the camera can pick this up or not, but the stems also have a little bit of fuzz to them. Once again, it's April. It's still relatively early in the plant kingdom. And so this plant will eventually develop little buttons, little round wheel kind of fruits, which make it very easy to identify a common mallow. But currently it's too early, so we don't have that luxury. And so we have to identify it by the leaves and the stem. Now on this channel last year, I did something that I've been meaning to do for a long time. I actually cultivated okra in my garden and then compared and contrasted it to the common mallow. And so that video is up on YouTube for those that are interested. I may even link to it in this video here. I compared okra and mallow together and found that the root system of common mallow was exponentially bigger than okra. I mean, I'm talking four or five times longer. To me, that's a testament that wild edibles are much more nutritious than store-bought foods or cultivated foods, foods that have been hybridized, because when those roots penetrate soil and go deep down below the somewhat depleted topsoil, they're able to grab and draw out more vitamins and minerals 
and put that in their leaves, in their meristematic growing parts, and transfer those elements over to you, the eater. Look, we haven't even made it that far. We started over there, and we probably have traveled like 20 feet, and we've already found five plants to talk about. Let's keep going. A little quick diversion here, two steps later. Here's some old kale left over from last year. We got some big old kale. And so before I mow all this down, I'm probably gonna harvest some of this kale and reap some of last year's labor. Reap the fruits of last year's labor. Okay, hopefully the sun isn't getting too bright and we can still see stuff. I believe this is plant number six. And this, my friends, is called Curly Dock. And the reason it's called Curly Dock, I presume, is because it kind of the leaves kind of curl at the edges. So let's get kind of a bigger leaf and see if we can spot that a little bit more clearly. Right there, there you go. Curly Dock, it kind of is curling in the same way that some kale leaves curl. And that is a very good identifying characteristic this plant, unlike some of the other ones we've talked about, grows a lot taller. So this right here is probably like, I'm gonna say three feet tall at this point. Sometimes it gets even taller. So those are all good identifying characteristics. Curly dock will also develop these seed pods, which help users identify it further. These seed pods will eventually turn brown and they'll rustle in the wind. So one of the things I often preach when I'm talking about wild edibles is that you use all five of your senses when harvesting new and familiar plants because our senses were all given to us for preservation. And so it's all too, too easy in this world of ours to rely on just one or two senses like our sense of sight or our sense of hearing. But we have other senses that are there to keep us safe. And so with wild edible harvesting in particular, I always advocate that you incorporate all of your other senses to help you out. So for example, incorporate your sense of touch to make sure that things are soft and you're not gonna break your teeth when you bite into them. And likewise, if you incorporate your sense of hearing, when these seeds mature, they're gonna rustle in the wind. As the wind blows gently, they're gonna go you know, that's a very bad, that's a very bad impression, but they're going to rustle in the wind and you might just hear curly dock before you see it. Curly dock is slightly lemony to the taste. It's quite pleasant, actually. The same rules apply to this as every other plant. The smaller the leaves, the more delicious they are. Earlier, I mentioned that plantain is a great remedy for skin ailments. Curly dock is the next best thing. And so if you can't find plantain and you have dock readily available, you can do the exact same thing. Chew it up, make a poultice. Kind of like that. I know I have green teeth now, but I'm trying to make a point here. So if you apply this to um, any sort of skin ailment, you should feel instant relief. This is especially true with stinging nettles. Curly dock in many books is referenced as an ailment, as a uh, remedy against the burning and itching of stinging nettles. So if you find yourself in a nettles patch and you're sick of the hurt, put some curly dock on it. If I'm counting this accurately, then we've done six plants. And so we have to do four more. Should not be a problem at all. This next plant is gonna require gloves and a knife to harvest. And the reason is, is because it's very, very prickly and sharp. This is a noxious thistle of some sort. Thistles are all in the sunflower family, asters. And so that's a huge family of edible plants. Obviously for a plant like this, you don't really wanna eat the leaves cause they're spiky, but there are other parts that are favorable, including the roots and maybe one day We'll explore this in my kitchen. Um, so with this plant, what did I do with my knife? Here it is. With this plant, you want to carefully 
get rid of all the thorns. And the roots as well. And you just want to go after the root stock. So you just kind of peel off anything that you don't want to eat. Everybody has a different threshold of what that is and what that means. For me, I just don't like getting pricked in my tongue or in the roof of my mouth. And so I like to take my time and kind of do something like that. This is the rootstock of a thistle right here. Once you've peeled your thistle, it's kind of going to look like a green potato or uh, a peeled English cucumber. And this entire part is nutritious and rich, uh, rich, full of water content. And it tastes kind of like romaine lettuce. This one in particular is a little bit bitter, a little too bitter for my liking, but it's not bad. Not bad at all, actually. The more, the closer I get to the center, the less bitter it is. The super awesome thing about thistle is that it's part of the sunflower family, the aster family. And so there's thousands upon thousands of different types of sunflowers. A lot of them are edible. A lot of them are delicious. And best of all, this is a noxious weed. No environmental agency out there that I'm aware of wants this around. So by eating thistle, you're literally doing a good deed for your local environment. That's my one good deed for the day. I can be a dick for the rest of the day after I did this. I see some wild radish over there. Right over here. Let's talk about that next. So this right here is wild radish. And this plant grows just about everywhere here in Southern Oregon, Northern California and beyond. It grows in a basal rosette, which just means basically like a bunch clustered together. And it's very bountiful. It's very, very bountiful. Wild radish is in the mustard family. Mustards compose one of the biggest family of plants, the brassica family, which includes kale and cabbage and broccoli and cauliflower. I don't like to speak in absolutes, but if I absolutely impressed, I would say that all, <laughs> most, most mustards are edible. Let's say that. And one truism about mustards is that all mustards smell like mustard. So. Remember when we talked about using other senses, not just sight and hearing and touch? For some plants like this, the easiest way to identify them is to crush them in your hands and give them a sniff. And this wild radish right here smells like mustard. And I'm not talking about Dijon mustard, I'm talking about the plant mustard. So it does have that familiar mustard smell, but it also kind of smells like mustard on cabbage or kale. It's got a very rich vegetable smell to it. I'd say 95% of the time when I harvest plants for food, I tend to stick to harvesting leaves, flowers, and fruits because those parts are the gift of the plant to the eater. And so they're easy to regenerate and the plant wants you to eat those parts. Generally speaking, I don't hunt roots because that will kill the plant. So just keep that in mind when you go out foraging. It's also worth noting that for all of the plants that we're talking about today, these things are considered weeds. They're very resilient. You know, if there's a hundred dandelions out there and you pull 99 of them with the roots, it doesn't really matter. They're going to keep coming back. But with certain plants like wild ginger, uh, this is not the case. So when in doubt, just go after the leaves and the flowers and the fruits. By my count, this uh, wild radish, this lobed wild radish with slightly fuzzy leaves is plant number eight, which means that we have two more plants to go. Okay, we're hunting. Here's another plant worth discussing. This is a different kind of thistle right here. This, my friends, is known as sow thistle. And sow thistle 
has much smaller thorns than the last thistle that we discussed. And thus, it is a much more favorable plant to eat. And as you can see, I'm not wearing gloves while handling it. The thorns or prickles that are on this plant are very malleable. And so when I touch them, they bend, they don't really prick me. Since we've started the tradition of naming plant characteristics out loud, we might as well continue here with sow thistle. So let's quickly take a moment to look for characteristics that will help us remember this plant. And I apologize if this video is repetitive, um, although not too hard because I'm doing it on purpose to solidify the point that if you observe things carefully, that'll be kind of like a shortcut. It'll help you learn. And so when I repeat things in my wild edibles videos, I do that intentionally, guilty as charged. I do that intentionally to aid in the learning process. So what does this plant look like to you guys? The first thing that I notice is that the leaves are a little bit curly, kind of like curly dock, but they appear to be a lot more tender. They're more like a baby green and not so much like a kale leaf. Can you see that? Another thing that I'm noticing is that the stem, the main stem, kind of sits in these in, in, the, in the groove of the leaf a little bit more than is typical, I would say. So those are good identifying characteristics. And then, whereas a dandelion has one flower at the top of its leaves, sow thistle has a bunch of flower pods, flower heads that have not yet bloomed. And so when they do, there's going to be multiple flowers atop this plant. And that is a very good identifying characteristic. Additionally, the stem is hollow. It's tender and it produces a white sap. This white sap, sometimes in literature, is said not to be good for you to consume. Uh, but in my personal research, I found that mostly that is garbage. In fact, that white sap actually contains all the micronutrients that help your inner organs. So don't fear the sap. I've been eating it for many, many years and I've never had a negative reaction. Though, do your due diligence and again, start slow whenever incorporating new plants into your diet. So that's how you identify sow thistle. This plant is extremely delicious in soups. And so that's what I'm gonna recommend for the user to try. Just pick heaps of this plant and chop it up and use it as a pot herb. Throw it in your soups, throw it in your stews throw it in your, I don't know, whatever you want, cook it and enjoy it. By my count, that's nine plants, which means we have one more to go. And I'm gonna deviate from my garden patch because it's springtime and we're gonna run all the way over there into that field where you see a little bit of yellow flowers to talk about the 10th plant, which is, well, I'll tell you when we get there. Whee! Whoa, watch out. And we've arrived. Let me just catch my breath. Ah! I couldn't possibly finish this video without talking about wild mustard because it's absolutely everywhere in the springtime. And it's one of the easier things to identify here in Southern Oregon because you can literally look out across fields and just see entire seas of yellow. Often that yellow color comes from the mustard. Let's just quickly examine it like we have been doing. So all mustards smell like mustard. And by that definition, we got to do the test. So you can crush up any part of the mustard and give it a smell. And you'll find that it smells spicy and mustard-like. So the flowers spell, smell spicy. The leaves should also spell, smell, I don't know why I can't say smell right now. The leaves should also smell spicy. And that is true, and they smell just like mustard. So we have in fact identified wild mustard. And for this plant in particular, this time of year, what I love to do is harvest the yellow flowers 
and throw those raw on salads because what salad isn't better with a little color on it? And so I just come out here and pick a bunch of flowers. If I'm wearing a hat, I like to fill my hat with it. And now you know how Sergey eats mustard. Now, if we squat down a little bit, we can see that, let me just set the flowers there for a second. We can see that the leaves of mustard kind of resemble collard leaves because collards are also in the brassica family. So there's some similarities there. They kind of look like baby collard greens. And so we can pick some of those. These appear to be a little bit yellowish, so not a problem. We just move over to the next plant and pick some choice leaves. Like that, How about like that. And then we grab our flowers and head on home with our bounty. Free food that's more nutritious than store-bought food. I think that's pretty special. I asked my viewers in the beginning to make note that this sea of green looks a little overwhelming to the untrained eye. And now I wanna ask you again, now that we've identified nine plants from here, is it less overwhelming now that you've learned how to differentiate some plants from others? Do you see, or do you feel rather, that you can distinguish a little bit better in this patch of green between clover and dandelions and mallow and beyond. I want to hear from you. Let me know in the comments below. Are you learning some stuff? Are you enjoying my content? If so, give me a like. The YouTube algorithm requires it these days. And so if you smash that like button, it'll tell YouTube to put this video in front of more faces, thus teaching more people about wild edibles knowledge. There you have it, folks. That's 10 plants that are edible, that likely grow in your vicinity. And I'm pretty sure that you'll remember all of them, or at least half of them. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure with all of the things that we discussed, you'll be able to remember some of those plants for life. And if you don't, then you could easily rewatch this video.